In this video, I'm gonna show you how literally anyone, yes, even you, can start designing in 3D using the incredibly easy to use web browser-based 3D tool called Spline. Are we in the future? I think we're in the future. Spline is an easy to use 3D design tool that is really geared towards folks who have very limited or no experience in 3D. It's way easier to learn than full featured 3D apps like Cinema 4D or Blender because it doesn't bog you down with loads and loads of settings or features. And the best part about all this, Spline in its current iteration is free. That's right. And because it's browser based, means you don't have to have a souped up computer or worry about hardware considerations. The democratization of 3D is here. And in this video, I'm gonna be walking you through the ins and outs of Spline, showing you the interface and how it works. Then I'm gonna be showing you how you can import vector paths from Illustrator and 3D objects from different 3D apps like Cinema 4D or Blender. And finally, I'm gonna show you how easy it is to create an interactive 3D web experience just like this. Now, if you wanna download the same assets I'm using in this video, you're gonna find the link to the assets in the description. So if you navigate over to spline.design, you're first gonna be greeted with this really awesome video that gives you a wide breadth of examples of what you can do with Spline. You can see we have basic modeling tools in here, which are very helpful. So you can actually create and author your own 3D objects within Spline app, or you can even import objects as well. But if you click and drag and rotate around this little 3D model set here, this is exactly the type of experience that you can create inside of Spline. And you can do it with zero coding knowledge whatsoever. So you can create this rotating 3D scene, trigger these animations upon mouse hover, all very easily inside of Spline. So it not only makes 3D very accessible, but these interactive web experiences very accessible as well, again, with zero coding involved. So this is a browser-based app, but you can also download a desktop version as well if you'd like. But I'm just gonna go ahead and open this app and you're gonna see here's our files area. We can create a new scene here. And then we have a bunch of these tabs on the side and some examples of some scenes you can create using Spline. Now, if you go over to the library area, you can see a wide breadth of compositions that were created using Spline. You can see you know, nice 3D stylized 3D. You can see totally 2D looking projects as well. So this just gives you a great idea of the type of work you can create with this browser-based 3D app. Now, some of these were not actually modeled inside a spline. The cool thing about spline is you can import models and geometry from other 3D apps and use spline to texture and create these web experiences so you can utilize Spline even if you use a 3D app currently because it allows you to create all these cool 3D web experiences very, very easily. One other thing I'll cover over here is the learn area, which will allow you to keep track of all the important shortcuts and allow you to keep up to date on the latest YouTube tutorials, Instagram videos, and their social media accounts like their dances on TikTok and keep up with the spline development. So let's get to 3 d let's go to my files and let's create a new file. And the layout is very similar to Sketch if you use Sketch before. You can see we have our object manager on the left where we can select our objects and manipulate them, turn them on or off, lock them. We have our top bar where you can see a list of all the different type of objects you can create. And then on the right, all the different options where if you have an object selected, you'll get those shape and material options, even the ability to clone those objects. And if I don't have any objects selected at all, you'll see your global settings, which is your default lighting setup, the ability to change your background color to whatever you want, add fog and create new material assets. So by default, you're gonna have this rectangle in your scene. I'm gonna go ahead and just delete that. And if we click on the plus sign here, you can see the wide array of different shapes you can create both 2D, these 2D shapes, including a text object, as well as 3D shapes like your cube. There's even a lathe generator to create bottles and stuff like that, a bunny model, a null object, and then a camera and light. So you can even light your own compositions inside of Spline. 
So let's go ahead and let's just start by creating a few objects here. So I'm gonna choose a cube and you can add a cube to your scene by either just clicking with your mouse or clicking and dragging. And you can see we have this flat view of our cube. If I hold the shift key down, I'm going to be able to scale this proportionally. And if I hold the shift key down and alt or option, I can click and drag and scale this out from the axis center of our object. Now, if I move this, you can see I can move this around just like this is a shape inside of Photoshop or Illustrator. But if I go ahead and use these rotational bands, you can see that this is indeed a 3D object. You can see we have these axis arrows that we can move in whatever dimension we want. And then these little circles that will constrain movement to a 3D plane. You also see we have these little cube markers here that will allow us to change the shape of our cube as well as these outer cube corners that will allow us to change the overall size and scale of our cube shape as well. With the cube selected, we can go over to the shape options here and you can see you can adjust those specific object properties like add a little bit of rounding to your cube as well. And each shape has its own unique settings. So if we go and grab a torus here, I'm just gonna click to create a little torus. I'll scale this up again, holding the shift key down and I can rotate this along the axis bands. You can see on this object, these little cubes right here will allow us to actually thicken the width of that tube shape. If we go over to the shape options here, we can adjust how many subdivisions are on this tube. We can add a slice here and we can also control how much rounding there is on this shape as well. So I'll scale this up, maybe move this over to the side here. And let's add a couple more shapes. Let's add a cylinder. I'll just click here. Let's maybe rotate this around. Let's just build up a, a nice little composition here. A little bit of rounding here as well. You can see this specific shape has a hollow setting to hollow that out, make that a tube. So definitely explore all the different shape options there. And in addition to creating your 3D shapes, we can go and create, say, a ellipse and draw a 2D shape. And you can see that's just a flat plane. I can go over to this object settings, add some extrusions, add a little bit of bevel there and position this in our composition here. Now, another thing you can do is choose this pen tool. And just like in Illustrator or Photoshop, you can create a path, make a little blobby shape here, and you can always adjust the Bezier handle. So just like you would be working in a, a vector application here. But of course, the difference is if I exit out of this vector mode, this is now a 3D spline that again, I can extrude, add a little bevel there and position this in space here. Now, of course, it's a little hard to navigate your scene just from this flat view. So that's where it comes in handy to learn all of your navigational shortcut keys. And these you're going to want to commit to memory. So to be able to orbit around your scene, you're going to hold the alt or option key down to orbit around your scene like so. And you can see that now we can adjust and have a little bit better idea of where our objects live in our scene. If you hold down the space bar, that's going to allow you to pan. And if you have a mouse scroll wheel and scroll it up or down, that is your zoom in or zoom out. You can also use command and control and use the plus or minus keys to zoom in and out of your composition as well. And if you ever happen to have all of your objects just kind of fly off screen and you need to reset your view, just simply right click in your view and reset camera. And you will see that we are now back to our kind of default view and we can start positioning things around. Now, as far as different camera views, there is a lot of flat orthographic views that you can use. You can also use an isometric view which is like your SimCity view. And you can also choose whether you wanna look at this from above, from the side, or from front straight on like so. Now you'll see that some of our shapes have some nice 3D shading. Some, like the ones we extruded, do not. So let's go ahead and cover some of the material settings here. And you'll notice that each of our 
objects here have their own default material layers. So by default, there's two layers. One is going to control the lighting and the shading method, and the other is going to control your base color. So if I select this Taurus here, you can see the lighting is set to Fong, and on this object, there's no lighting model whatsoever. So it's just going to be represented as almost a 2D object. So if I change this to, say, Lambert, you're going to see that now we're going to have that nice diffuse shading going on. If we change this to Fong, it's going to be slightly different with a little bit more specular highlight there. Physical is going to have an even sharper highlight. And you can dive into each of these lighting options by clicking on that icon of the sphere. And you can see that you're going to reveal different options for each of these different types of shading models. Some have no settings. Some have a lot like the physical. And if we go down to tune, you can see that now we have this really cool tune shaded type of effect. If I have this tube here and choose tune, you can see this really cool tune shaded shader. And again, this is all real time in my browser interacting with that default light. And this is looking really nice. So I'm going to go back and change all of these to say Fong. So we got a no, little nice specular highlight. Let's go on this object here, go to Fong, and you can see that I'm actually ingesting each of these objects materials one by one, but we can actually create material assets that we can apply to multiple objects and control that material as it's applied to numerous objects. So let's go ahead and do that. And there's two ways you can create a material asset. The first way is by selecting a current object. And let's just say we wanted to create a blue material. And let's just say I like that. I want to create a material asset out of that. I'm going to click this icon with the four dots. It's going to bring up this empty material manager area. And if I click the plus sign, that's going to convert that material that was just applied to a single object and allow us to create an asset out of it that we can apply to other objects as well. And if I click on this gear icon, you can see all of those material properties. And I can now name this, say, blue. And the great part about this is, is I can select any object, click on the four dots, click on that material and apply that material to whatever object that I want. So this is a great way to be able to apply one material to multiple objects. And then if I want to adjust that material, like let's just say I want to go into the material and instead of the Fong shading, let's go to the Lambert, which looks a little bit flatter, more stylized. I can do that and that will update that material that is applied to all of those objects. Let's go ahead and let's maybe create a nice glass material. So what I'm going to do is let's select this object right here. And what I'm going to do is I'm not going to use this blue material. So I'm just going to click on this unlink and that's going to break this from that global material asset. And this will allow me to just adjust this material that's applied to this object right here. So if I go ahead and I change the color, Let's maybe choose this yellow. You can see it's only going to change that material on this specific object. And now what I can do is I can actually choose different types of color options here. So one thing that's cool about Spline is you can actually load up. If I click on this little icon here, I can click on that texture and I can either upload an image. So if you had a UV unwrapped image, you can go and apply that as a texture. And so this means that you could load up literally any of these textures here. Or if you had a pattern that you made yourself, you can load that up as an image and you can even adjust your projection, how that texture is mapped onto your 3D object. So some pretty robust texture tools for a browser based 3D app. So let's go and let's just add, say, a gradient here, see what that's all about. And you can see what that looks like. You can change the color of the gradient, do whatever you want. We can also load up some noise. And this is like your fractal noise. You have all these different types of settings, different types of noise that you can apply to your object, change the scale. You can even animate the noise as well. If we go to Fresnel, you can see this really cool like light wrap effect that's happening. Really cool effect. And one of my favorites is this glass setting here. So if I click on this icon here, you can adjust the blur to say, let's maybe up that to seven. We can adjust the thickness of this glass. Let's maybe do 100. And you can even adjust things like the refraction. You can bring this like super low, like 1.2 and you can see how that's going to change the distortion, the light refraction there. But this is just really, really cool to be able to have this like frosted glass effect. And again, if I rotate around here, 
This is all real time blurred glass, which is really, really cool. And what I like to do with this glass effect is you can actually layer on more layers to your lighting method in this glass layer. So I can go and hit this plus sign and I can change this color to that Fresnel and get that nice light wrap effect. And I can go and adjust the layer opacity, maybe bring that down to 50. If I click on this button here, you can actually choose blending mode. So how you can work with these material layers is very similar to how you'd work with different layers in Photoshop. So we can just keep piling on things like let's maybe add some noise and let's make this noise really small and maybe want to, you know, multiply that on top. Let's maybe bring this down to 25% opacity. Maybe try overlay and you can see now we have this like kind of grainy type of glass here and you can always click and drag to adjust what layer is first again, just like Photoshop. So really cool. And if we like this and again, we want to create a material asset out of it, we can go click on the four dots, hit the plus sign and there is our new material asset. We'll go click on the gear button, call this glass. And now what we can do is select our other objects here click on the four dots and add that glass material to say this cylinder here as well. So just super cool, the ability to create different types of material effects and the glass effect, the frosted glass effect is just super impressive to see in your browser. So another way you can create a material asset is by just going to this material assets area here. And this is accessed by not having any object selected in your scene and just going and hitting the plus sign. And this will create a brand new material asset that I can then click and drag and apply this material asset directly to a model. And there's this weird thing where it's going to create this little download object. I'm just going to go ahead and delete that. But now with that object, I can select that new material asset. I can name this say orange and hit enter. And then for the color, I'll just go and create a nice little orangish yellow material on that. And then that is my new orange material asset. I can also go up here, right click and duplicate that material asset, go to the gear icon. And maybe I want to change this to purple and we can create a purple material like so. And now I have all these material assets that as long as I have an object selected, I can apply whatever material I want to that selected object. So I can easily go here, change this to orange. And now I got a nice representation of all the colors that I have in my scene, as well as some really cool glass effects here. Now, in addition to being able to draw your own shapes, add primitive objects, you can import paths from Illustrator and even import geometry from 3D apps by using Spline's robust file import options. So it's extremely easy to be able to get your vector artwork, whether that's a logo, original design from a vector app like Illustrator and into Spline. There's only one little gotcha and that's just the difference between 3D coordinate space and 2D coordinate space in say an Adobe app. So if I select this object here, you can see in the properties panel, this is where we are in X and Y. And in 3D space, the very center of your scene is considered zero X and zero Y and zero Z, because remember we have Z depth in 3D space. So where is zero zero in Illustrator? Well, it's actually right here in the top. So if I go ahead and I zero out, if I want this to be completely centered in 3D, I'm gonna go and hit zero for the X value, tab down, type in zero for the Y value, and you'll see this is now centered to zero, X and zero Y. So when we export this, we're going to have an axis center dead center in the middle of this object. Now, if we didn't do that, if I undo that and we imported this object as is, our axis center would be all the way up here. And if we wanted to rotate, the rotational axis would be all the way the heck up here. So don't want to do that. We're just going to make sure we select all the elements in your scene and then just go to the properties panel, zero that out. And then all we need to do is export this out or save this as an SVG file. So SVG is going to be the file format, the vector file format that Spline is going to take. So I'm just gonna go and save with SVG. I'm just gonna write over that existing file. 
All these settings are totally fine. Click OK. And if we hop back into Spline, and then to import that SVG file, we're gonna go to the hamburger button here, go to open import, and then click on this gear. And you can see there is our gear icon with that axis center right smack dab in the middle of that object. We can see that this null is actually the axis center. If we click on this actual spline object, it will reveal all of those spline object settings like the extrusion amount, your bevel settings. And with that object selected, we can go to our material list here and again apply, say, glass to this object and go to the gear icon here, scale this from the center, kind of position this wherever we want. And you can see how you could just easily start importing vector files, vector logos from Illustrator, importing them into Spline, extruding them, and creating really cool 3D web experiences with those paths. Now, if I wanted to rename objects, I can just go over here, double click on the object and rename this a gear. And there you go. Now what we can start doing is lighting our scene, creating some light. You'll see that by default, we have the environment setting set up to have default lighting, which you can adjust here. It's just a you know, a default light that's up here in the top corner. We can totally turn that off by putting in zero for the intensity. And then we have this default ambient lighting where if we turn that off as well, it's gonna totally turn off all the lighting in our scene. So now what we can do is go to the plus button and let's go ahead and add say a directional light and we can just position this. Let's use our alter option key to orbit above and just kind of position this light where we want and we have this nice interactive lighting here. And if we have our light selected, we can adjust the intensity here. We can adjust the size and you can see the bigger that the size get, the softer those shadows are. And the smaller this size, the sharper the shadows will get there. You can also change the color that is cast from that light as well. So maybe we want a little pink light going on. And if we click off of that light, maybe we decide that, you know what, maybe we want some ambient lighting there just to flatten this out a little bit. We can even adjust, say, the color that's cast from that ambient lighting, maybe a little bit of, say, some teal or blue. We can turn on some fog, which is really, really cool. And we can even use the background color as the color for the fog. So it almost looks like these objects are kind of fading into the background there, which is a really cool effect. Let's see what that looks like. So a lot of fun to be had with these global environment settings here. Now, if we wanted to test out what this would look like in a web experience, we can hit this play button. And if I click and drag, you can see that we are orbiting around our scene, which is pretty fun. And you'll see that there's actually no animation involved here at all yet. Remember how we had the hover actions if I just X out, we can actually easily add those actions by just clicking on an object. And let's just say we wanted this object to rotate when our mouse hovered over that object. With that object selected, we can go over to the states and hit the plus sign. And this will create a base state and then another state that basically you will animate into. So if I rotate this on this axis right here and go to base state, you'll see that we snap back to the original position and then this state one, is gonna store that rotated state. So we got our two states. Now we gotta do is add an action, which is what is going to trigger that move from base state to state one. And you can have like a mouse click, you can have a mouse hover, and I'm just gonna choose mouse hover. And here you can actually have your animation options. Like, do you want to cycle this? Do you want that animation to repeat? How do you want that animation interpolated? Do you want that ease in, ease out? Do you want some spring? There's a lot of customization. How long is that duration from that base state to that rotated state? It's one second right now. Let's just go ahead and see what this looks like with this rotation. I'm just gonna hit play. And then if I hover over, you can see that it rotated and then rotated back. So if I go and X out, you can see that if I click on this cube again, I can say that, you know what? Let's not even cycle that. I'm gonna turn that off. Let's do a little spring action. Let's leave all these options their default. Hit the play button, and now you can see as I hover over it, 
it's going to rotate with a little spring. And as I hover off of it, it's going to go back and spring back to its original base state. So state one, base state. So really, really cool. And now we can go ahead and add these different states to all of these different objects here. So maybe this rotates like that. Let's add that mouse hover event, add some spring. And maybe for this, we'll go to state. Maybe we have this scale up, add that event, that mouse hover event, spring. And we can do that for all of these different objects. And once we're done setting up all of our states, hit the play and we can test all that out. And we got this cool interactive experience just like that landing page. And again, done with zero coding whatsoever. Now, I just wanted to interrupt for a hot second because is watching all this cool spline 3D stuff finally making you want to take the full jump head first into 3D and, and learn it for reals this time? Well, if that's the case, you should definitely check out our intro to 3D class called Cinema 4D Basecamp. And it's gonna equip you with all of the important 3D fundamentals that you need to add 3D to your tool set. So if you wanna learn more about that, check the links in the description. Let's keep on learning about Spline. So in addition to creating your primitive shapes and creating paths and extruding them, you can also do some basic polygon modeling techniques inside of Spline. So to actually model and use modeling tools, you're just gonna choose an object. You're gonna hit smooth and edit. In here, you can select polygon faces or you can select edges or points by choosing which mode you want. If you select a polygon and select an edge, you can go in use this extrude option or hit X, and this will give you this little dot, which you can pull up, and you're actually gonna be extruding polygon faces here, which is pretty cool to be able to do. You can also go and use inset, which is just extrude inner. So I'll have that selected, and you can extrude inner. You can extrude out again, and you can use the loop cut tool, which you can just go and add little loop cuts wherever you want to tighten up that mesh. So if you're familiar with polygon modeling, this is going to be pretty easy breezy for you to kind of pick up and start modeling. Now you are limited to some pretty basic modeling tools. You can always go over here and add some more subdivisions to smooth that out. And I got this, uh, it's a duck wearing a hat or a Lego duck head. I don't know what exactly this is, but all that's to say is that if you are good with modeling and box modeling, you should be able to do a lot of damage within Spline using some of their uh, modeling tools, which is uh, really actually a, a really good bonus for a web-based app. Like you're modeling, you're 3D modeling in your web browser, and that's uh, pretty crazy and incredible. So those are the modeling tools within Spline. But what if you have a 3D model that a client gave you or that you modeled in another app, can you bring it into Spline? Well, yes, you absolutely can. And I'm gonna go ahead and show you how to do just that. So here I have my little robot character that I modeled inside of Cinema 4D. I have some very basic materials applied to them. And one of the great things about Spline is you can actually maintain and translate the color information from your materials in Cinema 4D and have those colors applied to your model and translate over to Spline as well. So there is some benefit in applying colors and basic materials to your object in Cinema 4D. Now, if you had a UV unwrap texture, that's where you would need to manually import that in Spline and apply your UV texture, as I showed previously in Spline. But to get your model and these materials out of Cinema 4D, I found the best file format to do just that is FBX. Now, Spline can also import STL and OBJ file formats, but I found FBX maintains that color information and bakes out say deformers and generator objects very nicely using this FBX method. All of these default FBX settings are good to go. Just gonna go ahead and let's just name this spline test. And then if we hop back over into spline, so what we can do now is we can import that robot model directly into this project, or we can go ahead and just save this file. And we can actually even retitle this by double clicking on the untitled 
And we'll just name this awesome shape 3D. Yay thing. I don't know. And hit enter. Then I'm going to go back, go to my files, go to new file. And I'm just going to name this robot boy. And let's delete that default rectangle that's in every new project. Go to the hamburger icon, open import. Let's go ahead, let's grab our spline test, which is that FBX file. Go to open, it's doing the magic. And voila, check this out. There is our little robot with those colors still intact in our stinking browser. It's the future, welcome to the future. Now you might wanna clean up some of the objects here. You can see that we have all of these different null objects that if you just twirl up or down, you can reveal or hide different things. See a bunch of nulls, but here is our actual 3D geometry here. I'm just gonna zoom in by holding the control or command key down and hitting the plus symbol. You can see there is our little vent piece there. Here are some of the cubes that made up our object. And you can see that there is this default material applied to this object right here. If I click on say this headpiece right here, you'll see that default lighting and color. Now what we can do now is create a material asset out of this blue material by clicking on the four dots, going to the plus sign and just renaming this blue. And what I can do now is take that blue asset and apply it to all of these blue objects here. So instead of having each of these individual objects having their own materials applied to them, I can create one material and apply that material to multiple objects. And again, it's gonna create those weird download objects here, which let's just delete those. But let's just get this blue on that object right there and blue on this little surrounding piece right there. Can delete these download pieces. And now I can select this material and adjust that color. It's gonna adjust the color of all of those blue objects that we applied that material asset to, which is really cool. So you don't have to dive into each individual object and adjust those materials. You can just have one material applied to many objects and just control a handful of materials that are applied to all of your objects. So let's go ahead, let's go and duplicate this blue material asset. Cause what I want to do is add a different, like kind of brighter material to the face. So I'll do bright blue. And for this, I'm just going to use no shading whatsoever. And I'm going to add that really cool Fresnel effect. And I'm going to change the blending mode to screen. And let's actually see what this looks like applied to like say the eye object here. I'm gonna hover over until we get a nice little wire frame box around that eye and you can see that got applied. I'm gonna click off from selecting that object to get back my material asset browser. We'll apply that to that eye. Then I'll click off that object again and drag and drop this material to the mouth. And again, we gotta delete those download bits. But now I can go back to my bright blue and change this color to more of a teal like that. And then go to my Fresnel settings and let's change the color on this to be something like, like that. So it almost looks like an inner glow. And I can adjust the bias to say 0.5. Maybe bring the scale to 15, bring to the intensity to like five. And you can see we got this really nice glowy eye effect going on for that face. Now, one of the cool things about importing geometry into Spline is that you can actually import fairly low density meshes into Spline and subdivide them completely inside of the Spline app. So you can see, we kind of see a little bit of chunkiness of the hands there. So what we could do is let's grab this little finger object here and you can actually add subdivisions by upping the subdivision modifier. And if I go back and forth, watch how smooth this bit will get here. Want to adjust that subdivision so we can actually subdivide and smooth out geometry entirely inside of spline. So what you can do is just bring in low poly meshes and subdivide them entirely in this app. So no matter if you are a novice at 3D or you're very well versed in 3D, 
you have a lot at your disposal, whether it's creating your own geometry or bringing in low res geometry and subdividing it directly in the app. So now that we have this robot imported into Spline, textured fairly nicely, what we can start to do is add that interactive web ability to this robot. So just like we animated those basic shapes to rotate upon your mouse hovering over your object, we can actually just add straight up animation that's just triggered from the get go. So maybe what I want to do is have these arms rotate up and down. So I'm going to select this arm. You can see that in Cinema 4D I actually set up the axis centers to be right where that rotational axis should be. So as this rotates up or down, it's rotating perfectly along that like arm joint. And what I can do is again, select that object, go to states, and we're gonna have that base state and the state we're going to transition into. And I'm just gonna move this arm and rotate it slightly down. And I'm gonna add an event. And before we use that mouse hover, what I'm gonna do is just choose start. And that means that when the file loads up on a website, the animation is just going to start from the get go. Okay. So what I'm going to do is let's actually cycle this. So it means it's going to go back and forth and we're going to repeat that animation to keep repeating in the web browser. And we'll stick with the ease in, ease out. And we're going to do the same thing on this left arm. So let's add a state. And with that state one selected, we're going to just rotate this arm down as well. We're going to add that same event, which is just start. So it's just going to start and we're going to go cycle, repeat, and then let's go ahead and hit play. And you can see that we have the arms moving up and down just by default. And it's using that ease in, ease out interpolation. So I'm just going to X out of that preview and that's looking pretty good. What if we wanted this whole thing to hover up and down? So what I'm going to do is grab that top null there add a state and let's move this up. And so the base state and then the state one, is it just moving up? We're gonna add that event to just play at the very start. We're gonna cycle that, we're gonna repeat it. And then for the duration of that animation, let's actually have this be two seconds so it's not going too fast. Let's press play and test that out. So now we have this cool hover, we can rotate around. This is looking really, really nice. And let's X out of there. Let's add like a nice little ground plane there and maybe choose, let's choose like a light gray color. Let's add an ellipse for the ground plane there. And we are just going to rotate this flat and we can actually go into the position scale and rotation of this object. And I can just zero out all these options and just rotate this 90 degrees flat and I'm holding the shift key down to constrain into increments of five degrees. So you can see there is this object here. You're going to see that actually we're only seeing the bottom and not the top. And that's because this is only rendering out. If you see the visibility, it's only rendering out the front side. Let's actually render out both sides. So now we see the front and the back being rendered out. And what I'm going to do for the color, is I'm just going to load up a gradient. Let's click on that gradient color chip there. And let's change this from linear to radial. And on this color chip, which is the color on the outer side of our disk here, I'm just going to click on that color and just bring down the opacity. So now we have this really nice like shadow. So I'm going to click on this ramp chip and make that a little smaller. And now we can just go and scale up this object here and we can actually animate this shadow growing smaller as this object as this robot goes upward so i'll add that state so base state state one will just be we'll shrink this down a little bit so base state big state one small and then the event will be the start and we'll have that duration the same as the movement of the robot going up and down we will cycle we will repeat and if we hit play, now you'll see that this ellipse will scale up and down. And you can see that's kind of like an interactive shadow going on, which looks pretty cool. Let's do one final thing, and that is to have our robot look and follow the cursor as a cursor is moving around the website. So to do that, I'm just going to select this parent null here that has all of our objects included under that null. We're going to add another event 
You can add multiple events to a single object. And for type, I'm going to choose look at. And if I hit play, you're going to see now your object is going to point at or look at the cursor. So we got this really cool interactive experience and we can see if as we rotate around that things are a little bit weird, but we can see as long as we don't like orbit around here, things are gonna look pretty okay. We can actually export this out as a embed code or a custom website to be able to share this experience with all of our friends and clients. So to do that, I'm gonna go out and export, and we can export this file to a public URL, to an image, you can render out a video, you can export out a GLTF, which is great for using with say Adobe Aero for AR purposes. And one of the really nice benefits of using Spline for GLTF export is that using Spline to texture your models Sometimes if you export a GLTF directly from Cinema 4D, the colors and the materials will be a little off. When you go and you bring in a model to Spline and texture it in Spline, you're gonna have very accurate material colors if you export out a GLTF from Spline versus Cinema 4D, okay? And you can also export out just a Spline file to import or send to someone else that can also open it in Spline. So what I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna choose public URL. If you have the paid version of Spline, you can choose to show or hide the logo. You can say whether you want the ability to have the user be able to rotate around. I'm gonna say no, because you saw when we rotated around in that test that everything was kind of all over the place. The only thing I want is for our robot to just look at the cursor. So no to turntable. You can also decide whether you want the ability for the user to pan or zoom. I'm gonna say no to all that as well. And then I'm just gonna click export. It's gonna do the magic again. And then it's gonna give you a public URL, also an embed code that you can embed this code into your website. I'm just gonna go ahead, copy that public URL Let's open a new browser, hit enter. This is gonna load up our robot boy and there he is hovering around and he is now following our cursor. So you can embed this in a website, share this as an experience, but this is just so cool to be able to create a web experience like this without any knowledge of 3D really and no knowledge of how to code a web experience or a web animation just like this. I believe that web-based apps like Spline are gonna be the future of how we work. No matter if you're a designer, an animator, a 3D artist, it's not gonna matter what kind of computer you have or how many GPUs you have. Everything's gonna be on the web, everything's gonna be cloud-based, and it's gonna be exciting. We're gonna have the democratization of all of the tools. They're gonna to be very cheap or very free. And you're already seeing that now with things like Unreal, Unity, and Blender. So it's an exciting time to be an artist, but that also means that if everyone has access to the same tools, what are you gonna rely on? Your design skills, your fundamentals, your animation skills, your ability to tell an amazing story and work with clients. So it's never gonna be more important to learn all of those foundational skills. And I gotta tell you, it's gonna be very exciting to see where the Spline developers take this tool and see it fully fleshed out because this is just the beginning of this tool and just web-based apps. And it's pretty incredible what you see already in a browser and what you can do at this moment. It's it's crazy and it's, it's super exciting. So what do you think about all this web-based stuff? Leave a comment in the comment section below. I'd be really anxious to hear what you think about all of this and your predictions for the future. Are you already using some of these free tools and how are you liking them? Are you getting a lot of jobs? Can't wait to hear about that. And thanks so much for watching. Be sure to go ahead, leave a like if you like this video, subscribe to our channel so you can keep up to date on all the latest happenings in the industry and especially new things, new tech, just like Spline and browser-based apps. Now don't forget to head on over to schoolofmotion.com if you wanna learn more about our interactive online curriculum and be sure to reach out to our team if you have any questions. Thanks again so much for watching and I hope to see you in the next video real soon. Bye everybody.